Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Tatsurun Militanjena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Om Jnana Timarandasya Jnana Shalakaya Tatsurun Militanjena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Sarasati Devi Goravani Pricharine Nirvishe Shashanyavari Vaschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupatarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we're continuing chapter number 8 of the first canto, the prayers by Queen Kunti. Maybe we could ask the devotees to give me something you remember from Queen Kunti's prayers, which we covered in the last class. Any hands up? You remember? Who? Mahavir Prabhu. Mahavir Prabhu, yes. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. So, do you also pray to the Lord like that? Uh, I try to uh, pray to the Lord and say that whatever is uh, congenial or uh, promotes uh, my devotional service, He gives me that, and whatever is not in favor of the devotional service, He takes away uh, from me. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes? Vinay Damadar Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, Kunti Maharaj, uh, even if she was aunt of uh, Krishna, uh, but in, the, in her very first prayer, she recognized that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is inside and outside everywhere, even if he is not visible to everyone. Because of uh, uh, Maya. Alright. So he is both localized and all pervading. So he is covered. He's not visible to everyone. How is he covered? He's covered uh, from uh, his uh, uh, Maya Sakti and his internal potency. Yeah. And do you remember the example Queen Kunti gave? Mm. How he's not recognized? Yes, yes. Uh, the example was uh, for. Uh, an actor. Right. Just just an actor, we don't recognize when he's in makeup and in his some dress. Right. Mother can say, oh, this is your father. Yes, thank you. Yes. We had the quote from Srila Prabhupada's lecture. Prabhupada was describing the father is on the stage and the mother and the child are sitting in the audience. And the mother can recognize the father, but the child cannot. And so the same way Lord Krishna comes in this world, and the devotees, they can recognize Lord Krishna, but the non-devotees, they cannot. Okay. Does anyone else still have a hand up? Janmashtami Prabhu's hand was up. Really? Janmashtami Prabhu? I put it down because um, Mahavir Rupa, 
excuse the um, point that I was going to make. Okay, problem. <laughs> okay, we have another hand. Do I see Sachi Janani? Janai. Sachi Janai. Maharaj. Maharaj, Puti Maharani is praising uh, Krishna out of humility and uh, she is telling you listen to propagate bhakti amongst Paramahansa. So, woman like me, how can I know you? All right, yes. So, we have some quotes. Prabhupada was talking about this. So, is it a fact that the women are unqualified to know the Lord? Not in devotional life, but maybe in material life we, we can say. But once we develop in devotional life, qualified, then men and women both are equally qualified to, to render service, devotional service. Yes. And we, we had the Prabhupada was saying how all the different religions of the world, there tends to be many more ladies there than men, that they attract the ladies more. Yes. What was the reason? Why is it women are more attracted? Maybe a lady can answer for us. No response? Rajashekar Prabhu can answer. To be subordinate, to put oneself under some authority, to recognize someone is greater than us is difficult for men. Men like to be supreme. Huh? What about the ladies? Can we have a response from the ladies? Is this true? Do you find that? Are you ladies married? You have a husband? Are they like that? Do we have any ladies there, Padma Sundari? Chalika Mataji is there. Jairade um, Mataji is there. Kamalangi Mataji is there. Yes. Mataji is there. We'd like to hear from one of them. Nobody responding. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Prabhupada mentions that women generally, they're uh, more simple and they're willing to accept the Lord as supreme and submit themselves to Him. And they come with devotion. There are many temples, many churches, mosques like that, full of ladies. Uh, the Dalai Lama, some years ago, he went to Taiwan and he was shocked. He said, I've never seen so many lady monks. So many lady monks, you know, all monks with shaved heads, and as they do it in Buddhism. So many ladies, so, so many ladies join and we, we have this phenomena also, many, some different countries, we have many more ladies than we have men. And the ladies, they can accept this authority of the Lord and submit themselves. Whereas for a man, they have a lot of false ego and they don't like to be subordinate to someone, as Rajashekar Prabhu was pointing out. All right, any other qu points about what we covered yesterday? Anybody? Okay, we're, we'll just go on then. We have the... Murari Prabhu's hand is up. Murari hand is up. Okay, Prabhu, yes. as a lotus, uh, he was describing him uh, different part of his body as uh, uh, lotuses. Thank you, yes. Different parts of the body of Krishna like a lotus. Do you remember which parts? Prabhu, you have to 
unmute. We can't hear you. So, sorry. I'm sorry. She, she mentioned the garland as the lotus says, then his uh, feet as the lotus says, uh, then... Uh, the navel, the, the navel on the belly here, where the lotus comes out, is marked with the depression of the lotus flower, right? In nectar of devotion, different parts of the Lord's body are described to be like lotus. Of course, lotus eyes, lotus face, lotus lips, <laughs> lotus hands, lotus feet. So, by seeing the lotus, Prabhupada said, then we can think of Krishna. We should immediately think of Krishna. And we can recite, if, you, we, if it's nice to say the verse. Namo Pankajana Bhaya, Namo Pankajana Mane, Namo Pankajana Traya, Namaste Pankajangraye. I remember as a young devotee, we used to go on Harinam Sankirtan every day. So sometimes the devotees would sing this, this verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam on Sankirtan. Just like we sing the Maha Mantra, sometimes they'd start singing this verse and all the devotees would respond. And in this way we would all be thinking of Krishna and we'd be reciting verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's a very beautiful verse. All right, we'll go ahead. So we will ask uh, Padma Sundari Maharaji, can we continue with lesson number two? We didn't quite finish it there. We were. Lesson number two? Yes, we were still on lesson number two. There was a, a, we were at Vipada, uh, Vipada Shantatata Svat Tatra Tatra Jagat Guru, that verse. And there was just a couple of slides remaining for us. We just want to look at that. Yes, right, that's the verse. All right, so would someone like to read for us Srila Prabhupada's quote here from Srimad Bhagavatam? Material existence is full of dangers. The Pandavas, they had their wife Draupadi, she is incarnation of Goddess of Fortune and friend Krishna, but still there are so many dangers. This is the instruction that because Krishna is protecting you, you cannot expect that you will be out of danger. Danger you must meet because then you will know that this material existence is full of danger. Could we just go back to the previous slide, Padmasundari? Yes. We heard also how Lord Krishna particularly appreciate somebody who accepts uh, dangerous situations or difficulties, voluntarily accepts the difficulties and uh, a dangerous situation. By, accept, by doing that, we, we can become very dear to Lord Krishna. So I wondered if any of you had any experience of that, having a, a dangerous situation in the performance of devotional service or can you think of any devotees who accepted danger in the service of Krishna and Krishna gave them very nice protection and reciprocation? Anyone? Janmashtami Prabhu, I'm sure you must know. Yeah, um, I, I can speak of my own experience. Um, like in 2014, I went to America, and uh, everything that could go wrong went wrong um, for about six years. Krishna took away over a hundred thousand dollar investment that I had made, and uh, I had uh, major health challenges and had challenges with Hispanic authorities, and um, 
is that one thing after another, it was like uncanny how Krishna arranged so many challenges. But what my experience was throughout all of that is that my taste in chanting japa actually increased. I felt more and more Krishna's presence because I was pretty much forced to take shelter because every you know everything else was just falling apart around me. And so it was uh, very sweet. It was very sweet, huh? <laughs> and were you thinking also at that time? You were really thinking, this is very sweet? Well, sometimes when I was in the midst of it, it was like, oh my God, what is going on? This is too much. <laughs> but when I would chant my japa, a lot of times I'd go for long japa walks in the middle of forests. There were, like where I was living, there were these nice uh, walking trails through uh, wooded areas. And oh my Gosh, it was like amazing how blissful I felt. So at least in that time, I wasn't in a disturbed state. <laughs> but um, it definitely um, the, um, the challenges um, induced much more uh, intensity in my japa. Just to kind of, oh my God, let me get out of this mess. And I would just chant my rounds, a mess meaning the mental disturbances created by so many adversities. So um, it really didn't bother me that much in one sense, but when I was in the midst of it, you know, when things were coming at me one after another, then um, I definitely was disturbing, no question about it. My mind was disturbed, but the japa kind of allowed me to go through it without, you know, too much uh, disturbance, I okay. guess I could say it that way. Okay, very nice. Thank you, Prabhu, for this remembrance of your troubled <laughs> times. Eh? I, I see a lot of hands up. Are these all really devotees wanting, <laughs> wanting to contribute? Padmasundari. Padma Sundari Maharaj what happened? Yes Maharaj, you wanted to see the hands up, I have to come out of the screen to do that. Oh. There are so many devotees hands up, Rajshekar Prabhu, Murari Prabhu, Sachitanay Prabhu, Vinay Damodar Prabhu, Mahavir Prabhu. Oh. Oh. Any Maharajis? Uh, I don't see any Maharajis hands up. This is not good ladies. We want the ladies to participate in this discussion. It's very important that we also hear from you. So I will call on Chandrika Madhiji. And I'll call on the others also as we go on. We don't want you ladies just sitting there quiet. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Okay, somebody else. You must know people. It doesn't have to be you. It can be other people. Maybe I can think of my Guru Maharaj, Devamrita Swami, who uh, tried to preach here in my country in the eight, um, 18th, uh, 80s, um, when it was humanistic time. And it was very hard. You have to hide and... Uh, it was very difficult to him to preach here in Bulgaria. Uh, so that that was a dangerous sit that was a dangerous situation. That was a dangerous situation that he came there in a country where we we were not legal, and he was preaching and traveling and preaching. So at any time he could be arrested and he could be in trouble, big trouble. Yes. Um, but nothing happened to him. <laughs> so he was able to, he was protected by the grace of Krishna. Yeah? yeah? And what about the local people who would come to meet him? They could also get in trouble. Yes, yeah, some of them, I think they, uh, the police catch them, but I, uh, I don't know the details. Just, uh, I've heard some 
something that it was hard time. Yes. For, for the devotees. But now it's all right. But now, now, yeah, now, now it's very, very nice for preaching here in Bulgaria, and maybe for because of these devotees who, uh, uh, who are here in the difficult times. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes? Who is this? Arnathara Mataji wants to go on Maharaj. All right. What's here? Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I had blisters for 10 to 15 years. And uh, every time I used to eat something, uh, I used to get them. And in the temple, I used to have a lot of... Uh, I used to try to eat prashadam, but I was not able to have, have it. I used to have only a little bit. But uh, and uh, my husband used to go to many religious places with the temple from the temple side, but I was not able. So I I asked God, see God, please uh, help me. I also want to visit your places, but I'm not able to eat anything, so I'm not able to go. So slowly, slowly, this distress subsided, and uh, I was able to go to the religious places also. So that was really uh, remarkable. Oh, for for it took 15 now, years. It took 15 years. Yeah. No, I mean, before joining ISKCON, after, uh, I was having my blisters, but as I joined, so I prayed to God, God, please help me. I also want to go to religious places. I'm not able, and I'm not able to eat prashadam. So slowly, slowly, they subsided, and I was able to eat anything. Now I'm able to eat anything. Anything <laughs> means any prasadam. In the temple, also anywhere I mean, in the, I mean, to the religious places. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll just take one more contribution. Let's hear Devishvara. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dineshwar Krishna Das. Okay, Prabhu. Maharaj, a few years ago, about 20 devotees, we went through to a local mall shopping center to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books and uh, we didn't have permission but we thought that it was part of the December book marathon so we should really try our best and endeavor to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books. So it was going on for about an hour, hour and a half and just then the local security detained a few of the devotees and asked them do they have permission and they said yes. So. <laughs> Uh, they said, okay, fine, who's the person that got the permission? So the devotees gave my name and number, and they called me, and immediately the security detained me and took me up to the security office. So they had phoned the local police to come and lock me up. But just then, you know, I sang the Nishinga Pranams and prayed to Lord Krishna for his protection. And within a few minutes, the manager of the mall came, and he asked me about what do we do and why was I there? So I said, look, we're carrying out God's work and we're trying to benefit the entire society. That is why we came today. And after hearing my statement, uh, he actually said, look, uh, in future get permission, but uh, you can go today. So they found the police and canceled the police coming over to uh, lock us up. So that was a situation in devotional service. Krishna protected us. And, and did you get permission in, in the future? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Actually, thereafter, we went every month and we got permission. So it actually worked out quite nicely. Oh, very good. Okay. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Very interesting. Thank you, Maharaj. All right. We'll go ahead. Can we go back to the PowerPoint? Padmasundari Maharaji? Yes. Okay. You go ahead. Yes, we read this. Uh. All right, someone can read this one. Long ago, you are on the sea. You are on the dangerous position. However strong your ship may be, that's the plan. So you should not be disturbed by the sea waves. Just try to cross over the sea. Go to the other side. That is your business. Okay. So, like on the ship, big waves, 
Don't get off the ship. Stay on the ship. You have to cross. All right? Go ahead, Maharaji. Okay, objectives. Overview of chapter 8. Well, how did the chapter begin? Who remembers? The beginning of the chapter, how did it begin? What happened? Ashwatthama threw the Brahmastra. Yes, right. Ashwatthama threw the Brahmastra. And how, how was it counteracted? No, Arjuna didn't, what, it wasn't Arjuna. He prayed to Krishna. Okay. Who prayed to Krishna? Arjuna. No. Uttara. Uttara. Right, Uttara prayed to Krishna. Remember, Pahi Pahi Mahayogin Deva Deva Jagatpate. This is Uttara praying to Krishna to protect her embryo. So Lord Krishna protects the child and then we have Queen Kunti's prayers and we're looking, we're still going through Queen Kunti's prayers. All right? And we haven't finished the chapter yet. Let's go ahead. Next one. All right. Personal application. Queen Kunti and the Pandavas' dependence on the Lord. Remember we described their chastity, that they're fully dependent, they don't know anybody else to depend on but Krishna. They're very chaste. You know, sometimes you get people, they come and they're not so chaste, they go here and there. Lord Chaitanya chastised Makunda because he was going here and there. He wanted him to be chaste, just stay in the association of devotees. Experiences from our own lives of how Krishna endows more favor to a devotee who is in greater danger. So we heard this, we heard this morning about Indra Jumna Swami going to Bulgaria in the communist times, risking imprisonment. Sometimes devotees go for book distribution. We just heard from Prabhu about devotees doing Sankirtan, maybe locked up. Some, so devotees will take these risks for the service of Krishna. And that's very pleasing to Krishna. Krishna certainly reciprocates and gives us a lot of uh, purification because we have only Krishna to depend on in these situations. Then Shastra Chaksus, general principles from Kunti Devi's teaching that so-called calamities are welcome, right? When the calamities come, throw your hands up in there and say, Haribo! <laughs> welcome, calamities, disasters. And how application of these principles? Which principles? Who remembers? What kind of principles will improve our approach to difficulties? Yes? Uh, uh, whenever any difficulty comes, a uh, pious person has no other option but to surrender to or pray to Krishna. And remembrance of Krishna means that you will come out of the cycle of birth and death. All right. We, we have to fix our mind fully on the lotus feet of Krishna. Some people, of course, when they're, they're in danger, uh, we have the culture a little bit in ISKCON that we may pray to Lord Nishringadev. I think one of you were saying like that, you were, when you were in danger, chant namas, the Nishringa prayers. And Prabhupada actually gave that prayer to the devotees in the beginning of the movement when his health was not good. We were very worried about Prabhupada. We thought he was going to leave us. So at that time Prabhupada said, you can put the picture of Lord Nishringadev on the altar and you can sing this song. And he said, this is a prayer for the protection of our movement. And he said, it will also protect me. Prabhupada said like that. So Srila Prabhupada taught us to approach Lord Nishringadev when we're in these dangerous situations, when we're faced with some very uh, 
un un unwanted, undesirable situation, Lord Nishringadev can help us. Because Lord Nishringadev is Vignavinash Narasimha. He can destroy all the obstacles. Sometimes in Hindu society, people may worship Ganesh to destroy the obstacles. But we simply approach Lord Nishringadev because we know Lord Ganesh, he gets that power to destroy ob obstacles from the Lord, from the Supreme Lord Himself. That's described in Brahma Samhita. All right, we'll go ahead. Is, is there any more slide? Oh. All right, someone can read the final quote by Prabhupada. Good one. Maharaji, yeah. Go ahead. So we want to create a new generation in your country so that in the future there will be fluent speaker in Srimad Bhagavatam and preach and your country will be safe. This is our program. We have come here not to exploit your country but to give you something substantial. This is Krishna Consciousness Movement. Thank you. Prabhupada lecturing on Queen Kunti in Los Angeles. All right, go ahead, Maharaji. Okay, we've finished lesson number two. We'll go on to lesson number three. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, keep going. All right, so these are the topics we're covering in Queen Kunti's prayers. We heard about the Lord's transcendental nature, how he's covered by that Maya, and he's like an actor on the stage, and his appearance, how he appears, what was, what was the reason for his appearance? That's also discussed, different reasons. Why does he come? Did, did he come because the prayers of uh, Lord Brahma and Mother Earth, Mother Earth was overburdened, was that why the Lord came? Or did he come in answer to the desire of Vasudev and Devaki to have him as their son? Or did he come to rejuvenate the process of devotional service, like hearing and chanting. So different reasons are given why the Lord appeared. And the humility of Queen Kunti, because Queen Kunti is the aunt of Lord Krishna, so she doesn't want to embarrass him by bowing to his lotus feet. So she begins her meditation on Lord Krishna from his, from his thighs looking up to the Lord. Not, he just, she doesn't want to make the Lord uncomfortable by looking in his lotus feet. Then obeisances to Krishna, namo pankajanabhaya, right? This was all offering respect to Krishna. And the pastimes of Krishna, we're going to hear about these things. Uh, the pastimes of Lord Krishna, we have Damodar Leela, Mother Yashoda, how she's bewildered by Krishna stealing the butter. And she on, only thinks of Krishna as her child. So Queen Kunti is surprised because she doesn't just see Krishna as a child, she sees Krishna as the Supreme Lord. And then the protection of the Pandavas. We've spoke about that a little bit. The dangers which the Pandavas faced and how it won the special attention of Lord Krishna. All right, we'll go ahead. All 
All right, an interesting verse here. Well-known verse, often quoted. We can all chant it together. Jamma Aishwarya Shruta Shribir Edamana Madapuman Naivarhati Abhidatum Vai so, interesting, important words, right? Janma, Aishwarya, Shruta and Sri. Who knows the meaning? Yes? Education. Yes, right. Shruti is education and Sri is beauty, Janma the birth and Aishwarya the opulence. So material life, people are very interested in these four things. And people who are very much attached to this good birth, opulence, education and beauty, the, are, these, are these a great help to us to become Krishna conscious? Is it necessary? Do we have to be very good looking or very educated or very opulent to be a good devotee? Somebody can respond? We'll ask Rajashekar. Rajashekar. So, do, if we have them, do we have to give them up to be a good devotee? No, Maharaj, uh, we have to use them for the uh, Yukta Vairakya. All right, we have to use them for the service of Lord Krishna, right? And at the end, we have Krishna, is, Krishna says he is a kinchana gocharam, tvama kinchana gocharam. Who knows the meaning? Who can explain for us? Alright. Do you know anybody who is a kinchana? Sudama was a kinchana, was he? <laughs> Not after he went to Dwarka, he wasn't, right? When he came back from Dwarka, he, <laughs> he wasn't. Maybe before he went to Dwarka, he was a kinchana. Who? Kolaveka Sridhar. So, what is the meaning? A kinchana means what? There's, there's a very interesting quote where, from a Prabhupada lecture, he's discussing the word akinchana. And he mentions, he said, he said, uh, Gaur Kishore Das Babaji was akinchana. Right? He was a Babaji. And he gave the example, he said he was sitting in the toilet to avoid people because materialistic people would come to him. And Prabhupada described how this one Maharaj came to Gorkishore Das Babaji when he was sitting in a public toilet chanting and the Maharaj was begging him that you please come to my house, I'm having a big Sankirtan festival, I want you to come. So Gorkishore Das Babaji, you know, was just ignoring him, he didn't want to go. And the Maharaj was coming again and again and requesting him, please come, please come. So Gorkishodas Babaji said to the Maharaj, 
that you know you already have so many tenants you have so many people who are your servants they do they'll do whatever you say you want me to also be like that and the maharaj said oh no 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 i am your servant i will do whatever you say so then gorkishor das babaji said to him he said all right you come and sit here with me you come and sit here here with me you sit here and chant hari krishna you're ready to do whatever i say so you sit here in this toilet with me and the maharaj ran away so Gorkishore this babaji he was a kinchana he had no, but then Prabhupada goes on he said he said Ramananda Rai he was also a kinchana now Ramananda Rai was a governor in the service of the king of Arissa in the service of Maharaj uh, Maharaj in the service of the king of arissa uh, so ramananda rai he he was quite wealthy he had a nice uh, home he had a good salary and he had family so was how is it he is also a kinchana anyone can say You understand? Everybody can hear? Yeah. So, Ramananda Rai is also a kinchana. How is it? Voluntarily giving up? Did he give up anything? Ona ji is free from uh, material desire. His only intention is how to serve Krishna. He understands everything he possesses is Krishna's, right? He doesn't think of himself as being the proprietor. He he understands everything, whatever he has, it's for the service of Krishna. And he, because Ramananda Rai, he's one of the intimate associates of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya would spend so much time with him discussing the philosophy of Krishna. So he had he was fully detached from material life he did not think of, so one can be a kinchana and at the same time living in the material world it's not that we have to give up everything but we have to give up the attachment to everything we have to change the attachment to being attached to krishna that's the point Right? We'll go ahead. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, someone can read. My Lord, your Lordship can be easily approached, but only by those who are materially exhausted. One who is on the path of material progress, trying to improve himself with respectable parentage, great opulence, high education, and bodily beauty, cannot approach you with sincere feeling. So we all have to become a kinchana. We have to give up our attachment to these things. Of course, these things are very important in the material world. People are very eager for them. They'll make great efforts to acquire them. But they're a bondage. They can be a big bondage in material life. Go ahead. Go ahead. So Akinchana, one who has nothing, nothing is mine. Just like Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, he has a song like that, that 
Whatever I have, I have surrendered to the lotus feet of the son of Nanda Maharaj. My, ho my wife, my home, my house, my property, everything, it's his, it's not mine. So kinchana, something, we're thinking we have something. Yeah, we'll go ahead. So this is one good qualification for Krishna consciousness, when we're actually materially exhausted, we're tired of trying to make it in the material world and we've, not, we've lost interest, we become disgusted with the material world, we want to get away from it. But at the same time, we have to live in the world, so we have to change the attachment. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, someone read. This position is very nice. Niskinchana. I have lost it. I am now not cared by my family, my friends. Therefore, I am forced to come to you. Surrender. So don't kick, uh, kick me out. Please give me shelter because I have no other shelter. Yes, go ahead. Keep reading. So long we shall think that for my protection this arrangement is there. That is not niskinchana. Niskinchana means when I will think I have no other protection except Krishna. And then I fully surrender. That is the best qualification for Krishna consciousness. So Srila Prabhupada is saying, this is a, the best qualification, no other protection except Krishna. How can we cultivate this mood of a kinchana gochara? If we, you know, maybe we've come to Krishna consciousness without, you know, we're not really exhausted, we're, we're still, you know, somewhat enjoying the material world. And we come to Krishna consciousness, somehow we get involved in Krishna consciousness, we take up Krishna Consciousness. So how can we cultivate this mood, this akinchana gochara? That how can we lose our fascination and our attraction for Janma, Aishwarya, Shruta and Sri? Would anyone like to suggest how we could go about that? By hearing and following the footsteps of our previous Acharyas, can you give some examples of acharyas about what they did to become a kinchana, what happened to them? Like just I said, Sudama. In my mind, Maharaj like Srila Prabhupada. Can you say what happened? Prabhupada, when he went to America, he uh, built up a lot of uh, lot of temple, and then so many so much money came, and he just engaged the uh, pleasing of Lord Krishna and following the instruction of his guru. That's why he's up in China. So you're saying he, he like it, it came later. But I think even before he went to America, he was already a kinchana. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Right? Before he even went to America, he was thinking initially, I will have a business and I will make money, give it to my guru. But Krishna had another plan. Krishna took away the business and he didn't have so much money anymore. And then the family were no longer respectful to him. And so then he left home. And he was in different places in Delhi and Vrindavan. He was doing some service different for different devotees, sometimes writing and editing work. And then he took sannyas. 
it happened that he took sannyas. And after he took sannyas, he was gored by a bull. He was hit by a bull and badly injured. And he was thinking, why is it like this? He was thinking that what's happening, Krishna is arranged like this. Maybe he was thinking, maybe Krishna doesn't want me to do all this. But he understood, no, Krishna did want him. Krishna wanted him to go through all of this just to get complete dedication to Krishna and to put himself fully at the feet of Krishna. He took everything away from him. Even he had injured, he had him injured. But Prabhupada saw this is Krishna's mercy. So Prabhupada is certainly a nice example. Any other examples? from Shastra or in the life of great saints? Maharaj, uh, I'm thinking of Srila Bhakti Manoj Chakur when he found the correct or rightful place, uh, the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Thereafter, he resigned from his government service, his job, uh, because he wanted to pursue building a temple for Lord Ch at Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's birthplace. I, I, uh, he actually took, he took uh, the employment of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, oh, he gave up, he, he gave up his government service to take up full-time service for the Supreme Lord. Yes. Okay. Thank you. In Srimad Bhagavatam we have the example, the Brahmana from Avanti Desh. The Brahmana from Avanti Desh, initially he was a wealthy man, but very miserly. He didn't even give money to his servants, didn't like to give any money to his family. He was very miserly and miserable. He was wealthy Brahmana, but then he lost all of his money. And when he lost all of his money, then his family members all left him. And he decided that he should take sannyas. He left everything, became a sannyasi. And everywhere he went, people would spit on him, they would abuse him, because they knew him and they could recognize him, that this man has come and he's begging. And they were very abusive, very offensive to him, but he tolerated it all. He took shelter of the Lord in the heart. And in this way he achieved perfection. So like that, Akinchana Gochara, no other protection except Krishna. All right, any other comments or questions? We should understand, we don't have to give up these things. We don't have to have Krishna take everything away from us. I gave the example of Ramananda Rai, that you can keep everything, but don't be attached. Don't think this is mine. Understand whatever we have, it is Krishna's, by the grace of Krishna. And so you're good looking, you're educated, you're born in a good family, so many things. No, use it for Krishna. Use it to preach Krishna consciousness and you can attract many people to Krishna Consciousness. If we're all poor, or if we're all ugly, if we're all uneducated, it doesn't really help our Krishna Consciousness movement. Prabhupada wanted very much to see the educated people come and take up Krishna Consciousness. He wanted to see all people take up Krishna Consciousness, but especially when you get people from the higher sections of society, then it's very good and it brings others. Okay, we'll go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one question, if you have some permission, is there, may I ask? Yes, please. Uh, Mr. Maharaj, you mentioned that in the Damodar Leela, uh, when uh, Queen Bin, uh, Kunti was witnessing the Damodar Leela, she knew that uh, 
the small child which actually is basically enacting the past time is the supreme lord so how did queen queen kunti uh, come to know that he is uh, the supreme lord how did she come to know because from birth she is the devotee just like the Pandavas, you know, they're all Nichasita devotees, they're great devotees. So they know, they know the identity of the Lord from their birth. But Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, they, 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 they don't know because they just simply know the Lord as their son. Of course, they're also Nidja Siddha, but they're an, in this very special situation they're, that they're covered by Maya, Yoga Maya, and they simply see Krishna as their child, so that Krishna can enjoy the loving dealings and the affection which they have for him. It's all arranged for the pleasure of Krishna, and Krishna gets more pleasure from being with Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj because they show that intimacy and they, they don't show the same reverence and affection which is there, which Queen Kunti was showing. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. All right. Another quote here from Mayapur. Someone read. If we think that we have got now a very big house, we shall live comfortably and sleep comfortably, then so Prabhupada is pointing out, we're thinking, my house, I will live comfortably <laughs> like that. This will not help us to become Krishna conscious if we are thinking like that. We have to develop this dependence on Krishna. So Prabhupada left the home and that's the very culture that as we get older in life we should get out from the house. Even the married couples, they should go and visit the holy places, come and stay in Mayapur or Vrindavan or go to visit the holy places because we just stay at home. It's not very helpful for us to depend on Krishna. Rather, we're always thinking the family, the home, my home. So that is not a kinchana. Okay, go ahead. All right. We need a marriage to read this, please. Because they have practically no material assets. Such material assets are all products of three modes of material nature. They foil spiritual energy and thus the less we possess such products of material nature, the more we have good chance for spiritual progress. Purpose 827. So it appears Prabhupada is saying we all have to become poor, right? We have to give up our material opulence. The less we possess, is this going to be good for our preaching if we tell people like that? No. <laughs> so what should we tell people? How are we going to present this to an audience? Yeah? How are you going to present this in preaching? Someone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj Ji has helped you to discuss just uh, earlier that. Uh, Whatever we have, uh, we have to uh, understand this is uh, not ours, it's Krishna. So try to use for the service of Krishna. 
so so whosoever uh, comes in uh, krishna consciousness they don't have to leave anything but they have to change their consciousness uh, that will come when they associate with devotees and read prabhupada books and chant and they understand that the current consciousness is uh, giving them tension depression and uh, this krishna consciousness where uh, uh, we just work for krishna ownership is with krishna we are servant it make us free from every every type of uh, uh, material bondages. Oh, very good Prabhu, thank you. Yes. Yes, we don't have to give up, but we have to change the consciousness. Instead of thinking, this is mine, this belongs to me, we have to understand it's all Krishna's. As the saying goes, we're born empty-handed and we leave empty-handed. But in the course of our life, we do have that tendency to acquire. We want more. You know, we have one house in the Holy Dham, we have one house in Mayapur, another house in Vrindavan, and then we have our own house somewhere, maybe in America or in Europe somewhere, like this. <laughs> and we have, a, a, we, we have our own house, then we have some other houses for our children, like this, so much property. And we're thinking, oh no, I'm, I'm very detached. So we have to be careful. One of the things, I remember when I joined the movement, when I came to Krishna Consciousness, of course it was a long time ago, and I was very young. I was, uh, I was 21, I just graduated from university, I'd been working for about six months, and I decided I wanted to join and become a full-time devotee. And one of the things which really attracted me was how the devotees lived together, sharing everything. We even shared our clothes, <laughs> you know, we had, a, we had uh, the, the, the clothes were all like in a big box and you just came and you took whatever you wanted to wear, what you were going to wear. <laughs> and nobody had things like, this is mine, you can't take this, you know. We were all living together and we were all sharing whatever we had. So it was really, really nice atmosphere. And we were really into the chanting of the holy name. And every day we'd go on Harinam and we just supported the temple by distributing Back to Godhead magazine. It was just amazing. But so many people joined. And I've seen that phenomena also. Later on I went to New York and I was in New York and I saw so many wonderful devotees become, so many wonderful people become devotees. Because the temple was so, it, it, was, it was so dynamic and everybody was living together and sharing, working uh, without any spirit of this is mine, or, there was no selfishness, you know. Of course we were all young, but still that mood of being together and working and sharing everything was so powerful that it attracted many people to become devotees. And many of them are, they gave their whole life for Krishna consciousness. Go ahead, Parmasundari. Right, someone please read. Suffering and needy men, inquisitive persons or philosophers make temporary connections the Lord to serve a particular purpose. When the purpose is served, there's no more relation with the Lord. That is the difference between a pure devotee and a mixed devotee. Can you comment on this Prabhu? The, the first line particularly? Yeah, um, that's the uh, Chatur Vidha Bajante Mam. You know, there's four kinds of um, persons that uh, take to, you know, begin uh, taking Krishna consciousness seriously. Um, they're, they're distressed, they're in want of material facilities, they're inquisitive, or they're in knowledge. And um, so that distressed situation, as a matter of fact, there was a, there was a statistical analysis given are taken of devotees that joined in uh, the Pune temple uh, on the basis of the Discover Yourself seminar, which 
which was famous for recruiting IIT uh, students. <laughs> and uh, they found that it was something like 95% of those that took up Krishna consciousness were in a distressed circumstance. So that's generally the way it takes place. Uh, so when we become, become free of distress, uh, then, oh, I don't need Krishna anymore. But the point is, is that when one takes up Krishna consciousness, um, you know, and if he's sincerely chants, then he may, a very good likelihood he'll stay with it. And then also, Krishna may um, arrange for the devotee to experience distresses within Krishna consciousness, which will help them take deeper and deeper shelter so that they'll come to the point where distress or no distress, I'm here, I'm with you, Krishna, I'm your servant, and we'll just continue. Um, that's the pure devotional platform. So it will start, often, usually it starts with a mixed uh, devotional platform, but then the purification takes place. Um, so, but there are, you know, I've seen over the years, like I took initiation in 78 with, I think there were 18 devotees that took first initiation with me. Um, one devotee left his body, but I'm the only one that's active in ISKCON still. So, you know, we went through many ups and, ups and downs in our movement after 78, but staying with it, it wasn't um, the norm. It was more, more the exception <laughs> to the rule. So um, that's a, you know, an example that kind of underscores what Prabhupada's saying here. The devotees would come, you know, they're for different reasons, but then when those reasons were, were, were met, then, no, I don't need this anymore. Yeah, how, how can we overcome this? Uh, you know, just like you quoted from Bhagavad Gita, four kinds of people who come to Krishna, right? There are four kinds of people, and which one is considered the best? The one in knowledge. Why? Because, let's see a term, remember my Bhakti Shastra. <laughs> um, well, um, because he's accepted Krishna and his, his position with Krishna. Is that right? I mean, that, that would be my um, um, uh, philosophical speculation, not mental speculation, but philosophical speculation. He's understood that Krishna is the Supreme Lord and um, I'm his servant. Right. He's, he's got that knowledge. He's, he understands his relationship. And the he understands the nature of the material world. So the, 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 the interests or the, the, the tendency to want to enjoy the material world is not so much strong anymore because he's understood the misery and nature of this material world and the problems with the material energy. He's got knowledge. That knowledge is all like that. He's understood. So it's very difficult for him to even think about enjoying the material world anymore. So if people get that proper education, if they get the good basic knowledge of Krishna consciousness, then they're unlikely to go away again. Yeah, that, that, um, that's why Prabhupada really wanted to have the systematic Shastric study, Bhakti, Shastri Bhakti Vai Baba, for that very reason. Right, oh. yeah. There's another point, you know, if, if like, um, earlier in the uh, first Gana, I don't know if I can give you the exact reference now, but it describes that um, when one renders service, he becomes purified, and that purification means that he attains spiritual knowledge. So, but it, that also has to be side by side. You know, to get that spiritual knowledge and, and, and solidify it, one has to be regularly studying Prabhupada's books. And that's one of the main reasons that devotees, I feel, fell down, because that wasn't going on. It wasn't stressed in those days. Like exactly. now, in order to take second initiation, many spiritual masters require 
that their disciples take the Bhakti Shastri course. Yes, definitely. Very important, very good point. Yes. I certainly feel, you know, I, I, you know, I've seen so many people come and go in Krishna consciousness and really, of course, in the beginning there was no education. We didn't have any education. We, we would sit with the books, but we didn't really know the philosophy. There was nobody really guiding us. We were all very new devotees and it was, it was difficult. And so, yeah, a lot of different people did come for different reasons. But if they actually came to that platform of knowledge, then even if they did go away from Krishna consciousness, they would remember the philosophy. They would remember exactly their position and the situation of the material world. They would take that knowledge with them and they would have that deep appreciation of Krishna consciousness. So, very important to try to give people that good education. You know, we would join in the movement and immediately the next day you go out on Sankirtan and you're selling books. But nowadays we're much more careful, we try to give people, we have like bhakta programs and we're very cautious about bringing people to come and stay in the temple. You know, come for a while. Sometimes people would just come in, they move in the first day, they come to the temple, they just stay. But nowadays, you know, you have to come, you have to get to know people, and they check you out. You're much more careful. I joined the first day I visited the temple. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. The second day I was chanting um, 16 rounds. Wow, wonderful. Ansarupa was my assistant back to leader. He got me started with the chanting. <laughs> now he's the temple president in New York, is it? He built the Samadhi in uh, Vrindavan. And, uh, you know, real, real sweet devotee. Oh, yeah. All right, we'll go ahead, Padmasundari. All right. Naisham matistava darukramangrim sprishate anartha pagamo yadartha mahiyasham padarajo bishekam niskinchana nam na vrinditi yavat. Right? A nice well known verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Let's have the translation. Next slide. Prahlad Maharaj, he'd been asked by his father, where did you get this love for Krishna? So this was Prahlad's answer. This is, you know, there were other verses also, but this is the answer where he got, where he got Krishna consciousness. Only one place you can get it. You have to get it from the pure devotees. So, very, very wonderful verse. Padar Mahiyasham Padarajo Bishekam Niskinchana Nam Nyavritina. So, Niskinchana is also Akinchana, it's the same meaning. You have to find somebody who is Niskinchana, who is Akinchana, who does not try to possess anything in the material world. So, the same word is there taken from the seventh canto, Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj is saying, smear upon the bodies the dust of the lotus feet of a Vaishnava, completely freed from material contamination. Persons very much inclined towards materialistic life cannot be attached to the lotus feet of the Lord, who is glorified for his uncommon activities. Only by becoming Krishna conscious and taking shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord, in this way can one be freed from material contamination. So we have to find out those, devo those devotees, that devotee who is Niskinchana, 
who is not attached, who is not inclined, is not interested in this material life, and they're attached to the lotus feet of Krishna. So this is the idea. By their contact, take the dust from their feet. What, taking the dust from their feet means become their servant. Offer obeisances to them. Not that you have to go and touch their feet and grab the dust from their feet physically, but you have to offer obeisances. We have to, in that way, get their blessings. Yes? Go ahead. Right? Niskinchananam. Niskinchana, right? The devotees. Raja, Rajobishekam, Abhishek. You have to <laughs> bathe in the dust of their, this pada, the pada, the feet. Take the dust from their feet. From these people who are niskinchana. And this will give us the greatest benefit. Yes, go ahead, Padmasundari. Okay. Someone can read? And now, Isaac, that Mad I have not lost. I've gained. I've gained. That's a fact. So. So to do, so to lose material opulence for Krishna's sake is not lost. It is the greatest gain. When one becomes a kinchana, nothing to possess, everything finished. Then Krishna becomes the only riches for such person. Yes. So, do you have any examples you can share with us, Mariji? Do you, do you know about Prabhupada's life? Something I know. <laughs> what, what did Prabhupada lose? It's because Prabhupada said, now I am realizing that I have not lost. So what did Prabhupada think he had lost? Uh, he, he lost his um, business, his family. Okay, very good, yes. How much um, business did he have? Did he have a big business? Yes, I heard that he had he had big business and uh, he wanted to uh, gain a lot of money to build a, to um, to preach more to preach Krishna consciousness with this money. But Krishna had another arrangement. And what about his family? How many children did he have? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Yeah, five, five. I think five children. Five. Mm -hmm. So he gave up his, you know, he lost his business, he lost his family. Krishna took them away. But what did Krishna give in return? Yes, he had centers all over the world. He didn't just have a, one little house in Calcutta. He had homes all around the world. And, the, and he had many, many children, his disciples. Right? His disciples were all eager for him to come. And they give him much more, they give him much more love than his own family gave him. So Prabhupada, so Krishna took away one little business, a little family, but he gave him a big family. In, to, he replaced it with a big family and houses, temples all over the world. And so Krishna arranges. Krishna gave. Krishna took away to give something better. So this is the point. So Prabhupada is saying, to lose material opulence is not loss. Because it was for Krishna's sake. But Krishna becomes the only riches for such a person. So Prabhupada understood the real wealth is to have Krishna. 
he wasn't attached to having all these disciples and all these houses. They were there, but Prabhupada wasn't attached to them. They were given by Krishna for Krishna's service. All right? Go ahead, Padmasundari. Yes? Someone read? But there is a quality to such utterances also. It depends on the quality of feeling. It helps us. There is a quality to such utterances also. It depends on the quality of feeling. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> One of you. One of you, please. Whereas a man who uttered them holy man in great respects cannot be so sincere. Hmm. So what is Prabhupada saying here, Prabhu? Prabhupada is in first chanting holy to get this material. The Prabhupada is expressing the importance of quality in chanting. And so the quality, if, is it, it, Prabhupada said, if, if we are chanting the holy name in great material satisfaction, in other words, we're sitting comfortably in our luxury home, with the air conditioning on, and we have our servants waiting on us, and we're sitting chanting, <laughs> then it's possible that our chanting won't be so sincere, because we're in such comfortable material situation. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes, who knows the verse, about one who is attached to material opulence, Yes. Right. In the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification, what happens? Huh? Devotion service does uh, not take place. Thank you, Prabhu. The resolute determination for devotional service doesn't take place for, for those whose minds are attached. If we're attached to this material opulence and sense gratification, it's not that you have to give it up, but if we're attached to it, if we're taking pleasure in that comfort, that luxury, then it's not good. So the helpless man can feelingly utter the holy name. When we're in a really difficult situation, we're really stressed, sometimes it's the best situation for us to really call out to Krishna. So that is why some people give up the material world, they give up, they leave everything material to just fully take shelter of Lord Krishna. Go ahead. Oh, wait, before we go on to this one, I want to ask, you know, do we feel, are you satisfied that in ISKCON, that we, devotees in general are also a kinchana gocharam? Are you quite satisfied with that? Uh, do you see any problems here in ISKCON? You know, we want, we want, to just, can we go back, Padma Sundari? Go back one slide. I just want to talk a bit more about this Akinchana Gochara. You know, how are we going to... Can you go back, Padma Sundari? How are we doing in ISKCON? 
Do you feel that the, the atmosphere in ISKCON is good for cultivating this akinchana? We certainly saw Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada, when they got the building in Bara Bazaar, a big building in Bara Bazaar in Calcutta, he was concerned because he heard some of his disciples say, Oh, this will be my room, I will stay in this room, this room will be my office, like that. And they were all thinking for their own comfort, for their comfortable situation. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati at that time said to our Srila Prabhupada, our founder Acharya, he said, better to sell the marble and print books. And he said, there will be fire in this ashram. He didn't like it. So we have to also be careful not to try to become too much comfortable. This is one of the issues which confront the managers for the big temple of the temple of the Vedic planetarium. That while we're spending a lot of money to build the temple, that the mood should be there, that we have to cultivate this akinchana gochara, that we possess nothing. Nothing is ours. We are simply humble, insignificant servants. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching are based on vairag and jnana. Gyan and Vairag, knowledge and detachment. We should not become too much enamored or bewildered by the material opulence. So it's very important to keep that detachment. And the way to do it is by being attached to Krishna. Attachment to Lord Krishna. What happened, Panmasundari? There's a echo going on because they, they have just kept themselves out of front. So I, I had to just come because it was in the beginning. Okay, somebody's hands are raised. Is this some, co some comments? Dineshwara Prabhu, Dineshwara Krishna, you have a comment? Your hand is up. Regarding, uh, regarding Maharaj mentioning ISKCON specific, um, so I don't know about ISKCON globally, but locally, I sometimes get the sense that, uh, you know, devotees who come in and are better materially situated, sometimes are given more respect and prominence and elevated to quite uh, important positions within ISKCON. Uh, so... <laughs> That is something I wanted to share, that this is sometimes how I feel, at least locally where I'm based, but I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's a global thing. Where are you based? In South Africa. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes, it, it's certainly true that phenomena is there, that we do see people who, who are coming from a, an opulent background, that they, they tend to be given uh, <laughs> bigger positions. <laughs> well, I think it's natural that because they, ha because they are used to opulence, we want to encourage them in devotional service. It's not a problem. And for, for other people, you know, it's better not to have a big position, better not to get involved in management. It's better to just focus on chanting and hearing and serving. It's, it's more satisfying that those people who go into these big, op, big positions and managerial positions, they don't always last very long or they don't always do very well in their Krishna consciousness. It's not really conducive for Akinchana Gochara. That's my comment. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, uh, was, was there another hand up? I had my hand up. Yes? Um, 
what I've seen over the years is that like when I joined the movement, practically everyone was living in the temples. <clears throat> and, um, you know, they were brahmachari, brahmacharini. So that was a pretty powerful facility for taking up Krishna consciousness. Now it's more like people joining from the congregation and staying in the congregation. And um, I recently, as I mentioned earlier in the class, was in America for about six years. And the, the uh, it's the largest temple, the Alachua temple outside of, um, you know, outside of Mayapur, I would say. Um, largest population, but very few actually lived in the temple. And uh, most of the devotees were struggling like anything to maintain themselves financially. And as a result, they had very, very poor sadhana practices. Many not even chanting their rounds. So that was a, quite a shock for me, the kind of environment after having lived in Mayapur for so many years. Yeah, definitely. There's a challenge to maintain oneself when you go outside of Krishna consciousness. But was was there was there actually facility to help the people to you know to maintain their Krishna consciousness? Could they were they were they given the opportunity to do full time service in the temple? And there wasn't so much concern about that. I. I started the Krishna Institute there, which was, I was asked by the GBC to do something similar to what I did in Mayapur. So that was part of that focus. And then we also, I started with the youth, an initiative called the Community Development, Community Development Initiative, which had that purpose in mind. But it wasn't supported properly by the management, and so it didn't really last. And then the youth kind of, petered out, their, their financial demands and family demands were so great that they couldn't continue the leaders in the youth. But that kind of petered out as well. <laughs> but the, the, the management wasn't really, um, you know, they, were, they weren't concerned, you know, about doing anything to help the, the, um, the community so much. It was more just, well, let's just keep, keep the temple thriving, you know, with deity worship and the prasadam and kind of the basics. Mm. So, major, um, you know, kind of, uh, anyway, I don't want to be critical, but that was, the, you know, in, in the, you know, just my objective experience, you know, um, observation and uh, also coming through the experience of trying to do my best to serve you. So it was definitely hard. <laughs> Yeah, we do see, we do see, we still see that there are devotees, they're able to survive, they're able to maintain themselves. They may be doing sometimes, some people do book distribution, and other people doing other services like cooking for the deities or worshipping the deities. Some people in the office, there's always staff needed in different temples. So, of course, not every temple may be willing to uh, support devotees. They may not have funds, they may not have... But usually every temple will have some kind of ashram. Maybe small. Certainly that's the tendency is there all over the world that uh, we've moved from ashram to congregational. We have much bigger congregations than we had, but much smaller ashrams. Even in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong we used to have a good number, 20 or more, living in the ashram. Now we just have a few, and their only business is deity worship and cooking. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. All right. So thank you, Jan Mastami, for sharing that. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes? Mother Yashoda, right. Someone like to read? Mataji can read. My dear Krishna, Yashoda took up a rope to 
bind you when you committed an offense and your uh, perturbed eyes all flooded with tears which washed the mascara from your eyes and you are were afraid though fear personified is afraid of you this sight is bewildering to me why is it bewildering to you shoulder Oh, no, it's not Yashoda who's bewildered, it's Kunti who's bewildered, right? Why is it bewildering to Kunti? Any Madhiji can respond? Yes. Uh, because uh, Krishna is the Supreme Lord and in the same time uh, he gives to Mother Yashoda to bind him and to play with him like a real child because out of uh, pure love to Krishna Yashoda, Mother Yashoda just forgets about his um, superiority. Yes, right. Mother Yashoda forget. She's not thinking her son is God. But Kunti is thinking like that. She's thinking Krishna is the Supreme Lord. How could he... And, and she, she even says here, fear personified is afraid of you. So she understands the position of Lord Krishna. But she sees Lord Krishna behaving like this, that he's afraid. His eyes are filled with tears, he's crying out of fear, Mother Yashoda, like this. So this is the, the wonderful pastime, Damodar Leela, and Queen Kunti is appreciating Lord Krishna's wonderful enactment of this pastime. How bewildering that he's the Supreme Lord, but he's <laughs> taking this position to be controlled by his mother this for being a disobedient child all right yes we'll go ahead next slide all right queen kunti's expression of bewilderment all right i think we can go ahead Someone read, please. Highest attainment of perfect realization is to work with the love, but at the same time, depend completely on the love. The Pandavas were the ideal executor of this standard of civilization. Undoubtedly, they were completely dependent on the good will of the Lord Sri Krishna. But they were not idle parasites of the law. Mm. They were not idle parasites of the Lord, right? Parasite, they live off others. So the, the Pandavas were not living off Krishna. And that's, it. that's the idea, you know, we, th that's one of the problems about people living in the temple. One of the reasons why they're cautious now about people living in the temple is because sometimes the people who come there, they're more parasites than just active devotees. They didn't come to just give service to Krishna, but they just came to live off the temple. And so this is one of the reasons, one of the problems which uh, temple managers face, that you want devotees, but at the same time you want people who are going to be active and contribute service. So the Pandavas were not people who just lived off the mercy of the Lord. But as Prabhupada says here, they were the ideal executors of the standard of civilization. Right? What standard? That the, they worked. They, were, they, they, they worked with valor. But at the same time, they depended on Krishna. So this is important point here. Krishna doesn't encourage devotees to give up work. He wants all of us to be active. Mm. 
So it, it's not that they, they should just come and cry to Krishna, oh no, Krishna, don't go, because Krishna is getting ready to leave, and Queen Kunti is worried that Krishna is going to leave. And no, you should just stay, you have to stay, you have to protect us. It's not like that. It's not that they just want Krishna to be there to protect them. It, they're actually completely, they're completely attached to Krishna. And they don't want to lose the association with Krishna. So this is, this is the mood of pure devotees. Uh, most fortunate is to depend on the Lord. Right? It's good to be dependent on Krishna. We cannot, we shouldn't want to be independent, but at the same time, we should, we still have to work. Oh, qualified. The, I'm just checking my notes here. Qualified by, oh, the, the qualification of the Pandavas. Their qualification was personal character and physical activities. By their character and by their activities, they were qualified. They were very qualified, very pure and responsible in their character and very active in also performing their duties. They didn't sit back, just like Kurukshetra war. They're out there, they're in the battle, they had to fight, but depend on Krishna. So this is very important purport here. Uh, In the purport, Prabhupada talks about two kinds of people. He said, some, somebody may be anatha, ana, anatha, meaning without any guardian, nath, right? Just like Srinathji. So, anath, you don't have any guardian, you have nobody. And somebody else is sanatha, they have someone to protect them. So, the devotees, we are sanatha. We depend on the will of the Lord. That's the point. We depend on the Lord. We're not independent, but at the same time, we have to act. We, we cannot just simply let Krishna do everything. We don't want to take service to Krishna. We want to give service for Krishna. So, these are some points from this. Go ahead, Maharaji. All right, we just have a few minutes remaining. It will be a good exercise. Read verse number 40 and identify statements which relate Prabhupada's mood and mission. Verse number 40 of this eighth chapter. Identify and discuss. How many people have we got here today? We have 23. 23, so what do you suggest? Groups of six? Four, yeah. four groups of six? One of five? Three of six, one of five? Yeah. Verse number 40. How much time? Five minutes. Maharaj, I'm opening the rooms. Yes, thank you. Hare Krishna Prabhus. Hare Krishna Prabhus. Have you all read the verse? I'm reading my 
Maybe you can read it out. Yes. All these cities and villages are flourishing in all respects because the herbs and grains are in abundance. The trees are full of fruit, the rivers are flowing, the hills are full of minerals and the oceans full of wealth. And this is all due to your glancing over them. Can I read the uh, part part also, Maharaj? Yes. Okay, Maharaj. Human prosperity flourishes by natural gifts and not by gigantic industrial enterprises. Remember, we're looking for some quotes about Prabhupada's mood and mission. So, if you think something is relevant to Prabhupada's mood and mission, then we can make a note of that. So, uh, the uh, gigantic industrial enterprises are products of a godless civilization and they cause the destruction of the noble aims of human life. The more we go on increasing such troublesome industries to squeeze out the vital energy of the human being, the more there will be unrest and dissatisfaction of the people in general, although a few only can live lavishly by exploitation. The natural gifts such as grapes and vegetables, fruits, rivers, the hills of jewels and minerals, and the seas full of pearls are supplied by the order of the Supreme. And as he desires, material nature produces them in abundance or restricts them at times. The natural law is that the human being may take advantage of these godly gifts by nature and satisfactorily flourish on them without being captivated by the exploitive motive of lording it over the material nature. The more we attempt to exploit material nature according to our winds of enjoyment, the more we shall become entrapped by the reaction of such exploitative attempts. If we have sufficient grains, fruits, vegetables and herbs, then what is the necessity of running a slaughterhouse and killing poor animals? A man need not kill an animal if he has sufficient grains and vegetables to eat. The flow of river water fertilizes the fields and there is more than what we need. Minerals are produced in the hills and the jewels in the ocean. If the human civilization has sufficient grains, minerals, jewels, water, milk, etc., then why should it hanker after terrible industrial enterprises at the cost of the labor of some unfortunate men? But all these natural gifts are dependent on the mercy of the Lord. What we need, therefore, is to be obedient to the laws of the Lord and achieve the perfection of human life by devotional service. The indication by Kunti Devi are just to the point. He desires that God must be, be bestowed upon them so that natural prosperity be maintained by His grace. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. So I'll leave you to pick out some Quote from Prabhupada's mood and mission there. Uh, I find that, uh, can you hear me? Yes. <coughs> yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Did you get some quotes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Did you get some quotes? Uh, Maharaj, uh, we, we were uh, reading uh, self, uh, now we are starting discussing. Maharaj. Okay. Uh, Prabhupada, we are mentioning about the godless civilization. Uh, like how uh, we are dependent on uh, the on the industries and we are rejecting the mercy of the Lord. We are exploiting the natural products. So it is more into the godless civilization rather than become people becoming um, and de and devoted to God, surrender to God. We are exploiting the resources and to uh, become godless uh, civilization and creating more industries. That's way and that way we are 
uh, where uh, we are not getting the natural products. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one, one, one more point is the more the industries, the more the dissatisfaction happens. Yeah, the result is the result is that people are dissatisfied with that. The and, and one more thing, Maharaj, is that uh, as uh, the mission, uh, the Chala Prabhupada mission comes from uh, this property, that Prabhupada said that uh, we should adopt uh, devotional life, devotional service, then Lord Mercy uh, will flow to us, then uh, nature will give us the natural gifts, and we will flourish with those gifts, and uh, then we get more time, and when we do the more devotional service. So, no requirement of uh, working like labor or for industry and everything. Oh. So start with devotional service and end with devotional service. Oh, thank you. Yeah, very nice. Thank you, Krishna. It also says that uh, it, uh, industry, they squeeze the vital energy, very vital energy which they have got, that squeezed by, by industries. And uh, they got no time left for the devotional service. And uh, all these things, uh, material nature is under the uh, direction of the Lord. So if Lord is pleased, then I think there is no need of the little house when all fools are there. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Padmasundari? Padmasundari? Maharaj, time's up. Can I close the rooms? Yes, yeah, close the rooms, yes. You're muted, Maharaj. Oh, okay. You have muted yourself. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yes, no. Is everyone out? Are the rooms out now? Yeah, they'll, they'll join in a second. Okay. They joined. They joined. They joined back marriage. All right, thank you. So let me hear some, a spokesman from group number one. Tell me something you discussed. I'm not sure which group is which number. So, um, it's according to the room. Room one is group one. Group. We are in group one. We are in group one. We're in group one. Okay. So I was asked by our group to make a presentation. Yes, please. I'll, I'll try my best. Essentially, what Prabhupada is emphasizing here is the necessity of simple living and high thinking, and that the modern industrial industrialized um, culture is actually not productive in terms of um, providing the necessities of life for everybody and also creating an environment where spiritual development can take place. Um, one point that came up is that towards the end of Srila Prabhupada's earthly Leela, he described that only 50% of his work was completed. So 50% of his mission and um, so he had a plan to come. When I joined in 77, he was going to come to New York and then go on to Gidanagri and establish Daivivan Ashram. But Krishna had another plan. You know, he was in London. He had to have surgery. And then collectively, he and his team decided, no, better go back to India. So there's a lot of work to do in this area. It's um, still... I would say we're maybe about 49% um, uncompleted, <laughs> hasn't been completed yet. Maybe 48%. I mean, there's a few projects, um, Bhakti Prakash Swami, Bhakti Raghava Swami, 
they've started uh, these farm communities, which are really in line with what Srila Prabhupada envisioned. But not so many. And there may be part way there, you know, some of them. One point that I didn't bring up in a group, but I got this from Burijan Prabhu, that the original, that the vision that Srila Prabhupada had for Gurukul was that the output goes into these farm communities. At one time I asked him a question, I think it was in a Bhakti Vedanta class that he gave in Vrindavan I was participating in. I asked him a question, what, what, what was the issue? Why did the Gurukuls collapse, many of them? And he said, because the farm communities didn't work. And that was the, out, you know, that was what, why they were established. <clears throat> so they were kind of deprioritized. Anyway. You mean the children from the, the graduates from the, the Gurukula would go into the farm projects? That was the that was the vision that Prabhupada had according to Burijan Prabhu. Well here in Mayapur the vision is that the graduates from Gurukula will go into the TOVP. Well things are changing, but that was you know, this is at least coming from Burijan who was one of the uh, founding fathers of the Gurukul system. He was right in the very beginning. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. That was understanding. Okay. So thank you. Very interesting. All right. All right. Thank you, Jan Mastami Prabhu. So uh, we don't have time for another presentation. It's already three o'clock, but uh, we'll continue next week. Right. Um, yes. Would tell us the. Um, the, uh, close, or the uh, open book assessment. Yes, yes, I have it here.